Welcome. Um, I welcome you to our first of the three webinar webinars under the Sustainable Together project in 2021. Our webinar series runs under the theme Shaping Our Futures, Sustainable Approaches of Living. And the project Sustainable Together is organized by the Goethe Institute South Africa, based in Johannesburg, and the British Council. And it was already launched in 2020, so we are now in the second year. And also this year, we, have, we were able to give out, again, three grants to projects focusing on sustainable futures, community-based practice, and collaboration. And the three webinars will speak about the three um, main grant um, topics, which are Waste Not, Want Not, um, Water for the Future, and Return to Origin. And the speakers will represent um, different contexts, different environments, experiences, and also approaches to the topics and their work. Um, dear followers, of the live stream today of our discussion, we also invite you to actively join the discussion. So you are invited to give comments and um, put questions in um, the chat in Facebook as a post. So we will take it up later and pitch it to the moderator. And um, our wonderful moderator, Tobile Chitenden, who is the CEO from the Makers Village in uh, Johannesburg. She's going to lead us through all the three webinars, um, starting with the first one tonight, Waste Not, Want Not. And she's also going to introduce the speakers we are going to have on our discussion tonight. And I thank you already for joining. My name is Caroline Krisko. I'm the head of culture and development at the Goethe Institute in Johannesburg. And I hope that you will join, that you will enjoy the discussion and follow us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. We really appreciate that. Warm welcome. And we're really excited to be here to take part in this three part talk series, which has been called or titled Shaping Our Futures, the Sustainable Approaches to Living. And yeah, I think it's really, really exciting that we get to be part of this three part talk series. We've got Waste Not What Not as the first talk. And then ongoingly, as Caroline mentioned, we've got other participants focusing on slightly different topics. But anyway, as she mentioned, my name is Toby Lechitzenden and I am the CEO of Makers Valley Partnership. And we are a community-based organization based in the eastern outskirts of Johannesburg's inner city. And one of the things that we are very passionate about is this way that businesses, citizens, and government can come together and co-create mutually beneficial solutions that will address social and environmental issues that we face as societies and as a planet. And that's why I'm really, really excited about this theme of shaping our futures, because we all are shaping our future, no matter if we're thinking about it, if we're intentional about it, but even if we're not, we are part of shaping something. And the question really is how are we shaping? What are we shaping? What are we thinking about when we're shaping our workplaces, our schools, our homes, our environments as a whole? Because we are every single second of every single day, each decision is inspiring and shaping and molding something. So we hope that these series of talks is going to inspire you and awaken you to some interesting and innovative ways that we can shape our futures and have sustainable approaches to living. So I'm really excited to mention some shapers that are with us this evening, some incredible, I feel so honored because these people are just really, really, really just changing their communities in such innovative ways. So I'm going to introduce them to you. We've got Tamsin Boerta, who is an interdisciplinary artist. We've got Winnie McHenry, who is a social entrepreneur and upcycler, and Ruganzu Tusingwire. I hope I got that right, Ruganzu. <laughs> He's an eco-activist and they're all working in the areas of waste. And so following on from last year's conversation, which we already picked up on in the Sustainable Together series, there was a discussion all around precious waste. And we're going to pick up from there and have a little bit of a different angle, but really understanding what is this concept of precious waste? What does it mean to us 
as normal ordinary citizens, but also more importantly to these shapers that we have on this webinar this evening. And what does it look like in their respective communities? We're going to hear some of their waste solutions, their unique waste solutions, and also the outcomes of the projects that they're doing in these communities that are really changing the perceptions of waste. And also looking at how can we make these innovations more scalable and replicable so that we have widespread impact. But to get started, we're going to have each panelist just share a short five minute presentation. They're going to share about the work that they do, the projects, why they got involved, what, what makes them passionate about precious waste. And they'll share that in a short five minute presentation. And after that, we're going to get to ask them some questions. So as Carolyn mentioned, we want you to please share your questions on the Facebook live chat so that we can ask our panelists those very questions towards the tail end of this evening. So our conversation is from six this evening and we should be ending around 7 p.m. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presentation by Tamsin Boita. She is a lo-fi interdisciplinary artist and Open Shade, a hybrid project space in Brixton, where she focuses her attention on the intersection of waste, youth, and the arts. She is also one of the three current Goethe Institute Sustainable Together grant recipients for her project Waste Not What Not. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Tamsin. Cool. Thank you, Tobile. Got some notes. First time doing a talk online. Exciting. Um, so yeah, my name is Tamsin. Um, I founded Shade in 2019 um, as a community project space, sort of um, arts intervention um, in a century old building in Brixton that was previously run by Chinese stowaways um, since the early 60s as a grocery store. Um, behind that window was an exhibition that myself and Sally Gould curated um, about the Hong family and the building's incredible history. Um, tying to history is my own sort of personal fascination with, with waste, with what people throw away and with the memories attached to it. Um, and so in September, 2020, um, I opened Waste Not Want Not. Um, um, and as you mentioned, the project sits at the intersection of reclaimers, youth and artists, um, and is housed as a sort of artist residency. The artists were given access to the studio space, given access to a waste materials library, which is sourced by, um, sourced by myself from reclaimers from around the city. Um, the artists included um, digital artist, Natalie Penang, um, fiber artist, Taniqua Makwakwa, um, uh, Melissa Ontaba, a model maker, um, and Paul Makutu makes trash robotics, and then uh, multidisciplinary artist Francois Knutzer. Um, yeah, and I mean it was it was during the during the early days um, of the residency that many curious kids from around the area would pop their head into the space, wondering what these crazy things coming out of out of shade was. Um, so I said, well come on Saturday. Um, and we very organically started the community art program and we have 30 kids every Saturday since, since September last year. Um, we've had a range of artists present workshops. Um, we've done five or six murals around Brixton. Um, yeah, a very, a very, very organic approach, but, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a super, um, um curated program as well. Um, and so then in terms of the Waste Not Want Not project um, that will culminate into an exhibition at Shade, as well as a sort of waste encyclopedia zine um, in Isizulu and Sisutu that will be distributed to reclaimers, um, along with all of the waste works being fitted to a dump truck and taken to the reclaimer communities, sort of a homage to the people that have made this entire project possible. Um, I'd like to phrase uh, or quote Luanda, Luanda Klatswala from um, African Reclaimers Organization, and he calls them accidental environmental agents, um, which is a perfect, a perfect description of them. Cool. I think you can start with my first photo. Cool. Um, 
So this was the um, materials library being introduced to the reclaimers for the first time after you know um, months of sourcing from them. Um, and the way the, the materials library sort of works um, is the there's a source photograph next to the, the um, material um, as, as well as the compound makeup of the material and then the, the value per kg to, to, to the reclaimer if it is recyclable. Um, then these are some street artists spraying bags at a breakfast for the reclaimers. Um, we're members of African Reclaimers Organization Weigh Materials as part of a pilot project running out of Brixton so they can track how, how much waste is moving out of Brixton and the surrounding suburbs. Cool. This is Mpoma Kutu showing um, reclaimers at another breakfast. Um, he's incredible um, robotic crane, um, completely made out of waste materials, old drills, cardboard, wire. Um, and weeks prior to that, reclaimers were sourcing old drills and toys. Um, and I think this could give them a good gauge of, of you know, what's possible with that sort of material. Um, then this is Francois Knutzer. Um, he was the last artist in residence um, on the back of William's trolley. Um, yeah, and I think in terms of this this piece, it it really reiterates the narrative of waste, not mind, not just a conglomerate of colorful curated waste um, coming out of a reclaimer a reclaimer bag. Um, cool. In the last slide, um, these are costumes made. Um, you know, it's sort of a collage of all the works. And um, we we made those fabrics. We made those two. There's basically a back and a front of those masks. And um, so it's sort of a collage of works that they'd been working on for the whole year. Um, and then we performed. They performed in these costumes for a 360 video that we recorded this weekend with Francois Knutzer, the artist. Um, yeah, it's a 360 music video that will be on um, on show at the exhibition. But the, yeah, excitingly, the, the, the piece of music that was written was written by Jared Perenzi using a sample pack um, that was all the kids' instru waste instruments that they made and recorded previously in the year. So, yeah, the piece of music's got all the crazy little vocals in and little chants and things that they, they had made. So kind of full circle. Cool. Thank you. Incredible. Sure. I can't wait to see that music video and those robotic waste cranes are absolutely incredible. I just think when you see these images, it just brings to life what is actually possible um, in terms of waste. So, so thank you so much for sharing, Tamsin. And we're going to go right into the next presentation by Winnie McHenry. And she is a social entrepreneur who is creating a better future through upcycling of waste. And she's a founder and director of Upcycle, which does training and development in communities with waste from many different industries. So I'll hand it over to you, Winnie. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. This is very exciting. It's really nice to know that we're actually getting the whole concept of waste and how amazing it really is out there into the world. We basically identified the fact that there is so much waste available in the world and so much people in South Africa, especially that are on the bread line. And because of our unemployment rate, we really decided, you know, this, there needs to be something different done about how we manage our unemployed youth, but also this access to the, all this free resources just lying around that's, that's available to everybody. So I initially started off going into communities and teaching people how to make a living from the normal craft range of, of types of things like doing candle making, mosaic, that kind of thing. And, but then realizing, you know, people don't have the funding to be able to take the money that they make from, let's say they make a beautiful mosaic, they um, make it and they go and sell it, but they, they don't have the ability to take all of that money and put it back into building their business. They take the money and the first thing they do is go and feed their family because that's their major priority. So for me, with my major love for the planet and trying to figure out how I can clean up around me, it was a perfect opportunity to say, well, there's this free resource just lying around. And if we can teach people to take something that's literally just freely available and teach them to look at waste differently, because it is a precious resource, it just depends on how you look at it. So we started looking at how we can develop projects from waste that actually are sellable and marketable. So with my design background, I went to go and actually show these people that they can manufacture products from waste. So the idea with the training is really about teaching them 
how to become artists and creators. It's not really about each specific product, although there's obviously the product is part of the training and they, they do end up making beautiful products. But the idea is to be able to teach people to look at resources very differently because waste is such an amazing free resource and people need to just change the way they perceive it. So um, if you can go to our first picture, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown on, on some of how this works. So in this particular picture, you'll see that the clock is actually made from a vinyl record, that's the backing, and then the little white bits of two liter milk bottles cut into strips and then quilled into the sections that go onto the milk bottle. So the idea for us is to really just put two or three or four different types of waste together and turn it into something that's absolutely beautiful. So um, uh, my name is Winnie McHenry and I'm from Upcycle Creative and I'd love to show you what else that we do. So we can go to the next slide. So in the working world of waste, there's a lot of corporate waste out there and people don't really always see the potential of the waste that they have available. So what we try and do is we work with corporates to, to work with the waste that would normally end up in landfill. So we don't usually work with the recyclable waste because there's already a recycling stream for that. So we, what we're trying to do is trying to alleviate waste now ending up in landfill. So it's usually stuff that there's no solution for. So what these ladies and gents are doing is they're working with t-shirting. It's from a corporate gifting company that do branding. So the, all these t-shirts are branded. And because of the brand, to protect the brand, they don't want to donate these products because usually the brand in this instance is misbranded. So they don't want a damaged brand out in the market. So they can't even donate it to people. So normally what they would do is they would shred this waste and then landfill it. So we are looking at really trying to re-engineer stuff. So those t-shirts that they were busy working with can turn into a beautiful planter. So it's teaching them how to take t-shirting and make macramis. And, and this is just one of the types of products that you can end up making with the waste that's available. Okay, next slide, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is actually waste, although you would never say it is. I mean, this is a beautiful chess piece. It's got um, brand new uh, wine bottle opener and a thermometer, and it's actually got all the chess pieces. Everything is 100% intact. And on the top is a chess board. But what, what happens is, a corporate will maybe want to print 20,000 of them to donate to their, their corporates or to their staff. And the bigger box gets broken or these boxes are slightly damaged by the printing. And instead of taking it back into stock, it's too much trouble. So they landfall, they actually, this is considered waste. And this is where it's really important for people to realize that waste is only waste to the wrong people because everything is of value. So you really just need to look at how waste can actually make a difference in the world. And if this can be considered a waste issue, you can imagine the other waste there in the world, how bad it is. So Upcycle's biggest mission is to show people that you always need to identify a problem and then look at the waste around you and then say, okay, if I have this problem, so we have a lot of nursery schools throughout South Africa with our children that are sleeping on the floors during their breaks because they don't have mattresses. So we've got a company that's got all these big billboard banner fabrics. The billboard fabric is really nice and thick. It's waterproof. So let's turn this waterproof fabric into mattresses for the ECD centers. So if they have an accident, there's no problems with the, with the waste. So the whole concept of upcycling and the company is to go into communities and teach them how to look at waste and look at a problem and tie the two together so that they can make an income for themselves. So it's creating entrepreneurs from the waste industry. So that's us in a little bit of a nutshell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. That's also absolutely incredible. I think, yeah, what's highlighted there is just the importance of business and societies and entrepreneurs working together, which is something I'm really passionate about as well. And um, because we can help each other identify opportunities opportunities in terms of creating value around waste. So thank you so much, Winnie, for sharing. Um, and last but not least, we're going to go on to Ruganzu. 
and he is an eco-artist, lecturer, and activist from Uganda. He is also an environmental art um, activist, I guess, in terms of his advocacy around Uganda. He travels extensively spreading the message of Ubuntu and also around spreading this concept of recycled playgrounds, which I'm just really excited to hear more about. He's also inspired two documentaries, one in Brazil and one in Sweden, and he's also initiated TEDx Kampala in Uganda. So I really just want to hear about your activist voice, Ruganzu, and the work that you're doing across the globe, really. Thank you so much, Tobir. I'm excited to be joining you guys from Kampala, Uganda. And uh, it's always a pleasure to share about the work we do at uh, EcoArt Uganda, which I began as a student. And uh, the challenge was to look for materials to use for art. And there was so much waste in our environment. And I started to build sculptures with the waste. And then uh, in my final year at university, then I built this uh, sculpture in a community where there was uh, tons of waste, but also the children were more interested in interacting with the sculpture. Then the idea of creating playgrounds was just not born, but it was very important to realize that the children were there and there was nothing to play with except the sculptures, which sculptures are the material that the children could relate with. And uh, from there, we just went out and said, you know what, uh, if you move around the city, there are hardly any playgrounds for kids. And uh, every private business that starts a school is only looking at building blocks. They're not looking at the space for play or the space that can also be used for learning. So I came up with this uh, idea that maybe it was about time that we could actually make ourselves a playground. And uh, we made the first recycled playground in a place called Chireka. And the piece was inspired by an airplane, which as a child growing up, you have this vision of being up in space and uh, the playground was movable. So we could uh, actually move from uh, places where people could not afford play and move this uh, plane and hundreds of kids would show up and they will be surprised to see that the material being used is actually something they know. And um, that really touched me a lot as a student to see that we struggle to find a lot of solutions where actually within our community is a way we can uh, work. And being a, a concept that was, you know, developed by an artist, you find a way of how to make it bigger and uh, spread out. So then later I went for further studies and I was studying uh, pedagogy which allowed me to find how to place the children in the making of the playgrounds. Because at, at the initial start, it was just about me being the artist, but then I was designing for children and the children could, could have a way they want to see their playground. So we came up with a, a way in which the children actually are involved from the design process. They come up with their own crazy ideas they can draw, they can paint, they can sing, they can dance, whatever it is, a form of expression in which they find their playfulness. So for instance, uh, I went to a, a refugee settlement in Uganda called Nachi Valley. It's the, one of the world's oldest uh, refugee settlement it has 300,000 people and everyday children are fleeing from countries where there's war. And uh, Uganda hosts around 11 countries in this uh, camp. And uh, the children there at the reception were much interested in having something to play. And I, I was not able to even, you know, allow them to draw, but to find stories. And they came up with this, uh, you know, giant elephants that 
some had seen on their way to Uganda and we built this uh, playground that was, you know, huge from their concept and idea. And the important part is that when the children take part in the building process, then they are able to repair because that's one of the problems of uh, sustainability in upcycling materials. It's that you build something today and maybe because it will not withstand the weather, it can easily break and go back to where you're trying to prevent it from going. So in the picture that is coming, uh, I, I see, yes, what Tabir has just shared is a sculpture that we did in Toulouse in France, and it's from uh, E-West, uh, which was collected by uh, the people that live in Toulouse Metropole. So the interactive mm -hmm. sculptures that we make is that the public can bring materials and waste that they don't use at home, and then you build a sculpture with them. In the slide that we're seeing, you see that uh, children in Chireka were able to collect all the bottles that were in their neighborhood. And we built together this uh, playground for them. And uh, the participation at that stage is such amazing because the ideas they have at the point when they are young is not the boxed one where play means a slide or a swing. It could be anything from building, you know, bottles up together to expressing themselves with paint and color over these uh, materials. And then I went over to different parts of the world to spread the same message whereby we were, you know, dumpster diving into this, uh, spaces uh, where the waste is thrown away. We call it waste just because most people don't see the value in it, but waste can only be waste if you waste it. So the interactive projects that we do is that any community has their own uh, problem that they would want to solve. And you sit with them and figure out what it is they want to build. And when we outsource the people in the community who are skilled in different parts in order to come up with these uh, installations and sculptures. So I've been uh, busy moving up and down, trying to find other people that work in different maker movements that build, because building is something that was there from you know, way back in time. All of us can build. It's a necessity of life. And uh, when there is a need to build or put some uh, piece together, the community is always able to come and uh, share their knowledge, whether they are, you know, cobras, if they mend shoes, if they are carpenters, everybody in the community brings their knowledge in my installations. So I no longer do the art that probably would hang on people's walls. I see that art is actually being with the people and finding out what it is that they want to solve. And to be able to provide such a space, I created an eco art residency, which is in the picture, that's where I live. And uh, the lower space is uh, for the artists. And uh, we exchange, uh, if they come over, eat what we eat and we build together. That's how we are able to share the knowledge of uh, a sustainable future that we all dream of. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm blown away. And I just think it's so profound that kids or children can see so much more than us and see the gaps that we are we obviously missing and have habitually formed these behaviors as we've evolved <laughs> into adults. Um, and I just love that they have such fresh thinking. And like you say, why does the playground need to be a slide? It could be so many different things. Um, so that was inspiring. I also want to come. <laughs> Tamsin just put on the chat that she wants to come see. So do I. Um, so we can ask... You're all welcome. Awesome. All welcome. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. So yeah, just a reminder to everybody that's watching on Facebook Live, if you've got any questions, please put them on the chat. We're going to get to your questions very shortly. But in the meantime, I did want to ask um, our panelists some questions as we're waiting for those other questions to come in. Um, really just looking at the synergies. There's a lot of synergies, especially between Tamsin and Ruganzu around this intersection of youth, waste, and artists. And the way that you're changing perceptions through that intersection or what is what is happening when you add those three ingredients together so maybe Tamsin you can just kick us off and yeah share your experience in terms of what's happening and what are the outcomes from that yeah um so I mean I think in terms of in terms of well, why the waste materials library has worked really well for adults for myself as an artist for other artists um, and spe specifically for the youth is because everything is categorized when you see a big mound of waste or rubbish I think it's difficult for people to isolate the things and say you know this could be that or this could be that um and really interestingly with the kids, you know, I think because when they approach the waste materials library and are working with the things, they don't know the item's previous function. So that naivety allows them to play with the material um, a lot more than I think, um, you know, even, even artists have to a degree. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think it's that. Um, and I think, you know, in, 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 in terms of, of specifically with the, with the children, um, I think there are, I mean, I'm assuming there are, but it feels like there are at least, are now able to look at these materials in a different way. You know, art is very um, 2D canvas paintbrush. Um, and yeah, whether it's putting something on the head and moving with that, um, you know, just, yeah, just being able to, to see the material further, I suppose, further than sculpture, further than, further than art itself or a practical solution, you know, you need, so you need to get this liquid from this side of the room to that side of the room, there's a yogurt cup. Um, so I think, yeah, waste, working with waste materials is also very uh, circumstantial. Um, and I suppose the materials libraries work really well like that because it's very much like, oh, this thing can connect these the two things um, sort, of, sort of thing. Um, yeah. And just to add on that, Tamsin, what has the response been from the reclaimers? I mean, are they working directly with the youth? What does that relationship yeah. look like? Yeah, look, um, look, uh, the the reclaimers are working Monday to Saturday, um, and specifically in Brixton, um, they service Brixton and the surrounding areas on a Tuesday. The reclaimers are moving through Brixton all the time, but those are the specific. That's the specific day that they're working through. So, the direct connection with reclaimers and youth physically has not happened um, because I wouldn't want to take them off of their work path you know they they and yeah um, and the kids you know obviously at school during the day so I think the connection has been more with the materials itself um, but where shade sits shade sits geographically on a main a main road that sort of runs I mean runs to the other side of the city and runs to the other side of the city um, or like the other side of the suburbs so it becomes very easy if oh, I need some metal. Cool, I can see the reclaimers moving. I can either wave, wave them down or say, can you bring stuff for, for next week, Tuesday? So no direct no direct link, um, but I think the materials itself are the, have been the, the, the link. Amazing, yeah, that does make sense. And I wanted to ask you to perhaps add on to that, Ruganzu, because you're also sitting in this intersection of youth waste and um, artists what does that look like in your community and in your environment and how are you showcasing that to communities outside of that because I know you use your eco activist voice in so many different platforms and so what is what has been that impact of using those platforms and how have you strategic strategically done so I'd just be interested to hear how have you used your eco uh, activist voice um, to showcase what you're doing in your community Thank you. I think to use the words of uh, Nina Simon, uh, an artist uh, is a reflection of the uh, society. And uh, when you are uh, an artist, you inv instigate or you spark uh, conversations. You kind of uh, 
bring out something that makes people ask why, you know, or relate or, you know, get out of their comfort zone to see something that probably has another side of life. And uh, young people are very curious in the sense that at the time when uh, you're growing up, going to an adult, you are very experimental. And if there is anything that is happening, it's always easy for you to dive in and give your time. I know a lot of young people willing to donate their time for whatever project that I'm working on. So being uh, at uh, the university teaching, I try to make sure my students, first of all, are able and are in contact with their community. They know what problems are there, or how can they solve them using the art. I have been able to you know, start uh, platforms like TEDx Kampala, which uh, allows innovators, you know, thinkers to come and share their ideas. In fact, in 2012, when I had the first TED event, it was only artists and it was only on upcycling. And I'm glad to see that this is 2021 and we're still talking about this topic and uh, more, more energies have come on board. And um, the other thing is that uh, when projects are born from a community where we see community as, you know, it can't go without unity. Then people are connected. There is a voice that is uh, being represented together to go to the last bit of the product. Whenever there is a need and people can realize how to relate and connect with it, then we have a, a successful project. So in my way, I see the interaction uh, between art, uh, youth, and technology as, as the future, you know, because the way we share, the way we are able to share our knowledge or learn from each other in terms of collaborations, in terms of, you know, getting inspired, you know, you're able to inspire more people to, you know, build, like, I, I I see where I live, for example, it's not having any structure that is a bit wild or crazy, but the way you start to build and people start ask questions like, oh, this uh, Rasta guy, is he okay in the head? And then when the building start to hold, then they start to think that maybe you have something to say. Then they look at the material and they know that they know what you're using and they are saying, hey, why should I buy when I can actually use this? So that combination of, you know, sparking that curiosity in people is what an, art, an artist can do. And I think technology has allowed us to freely share. Like now I'm in Uganda and you're in South Africa and I can't wait to have you guys here too. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. It is. It's these types of conversations and discussions that allow people that are not able to be in the grassroots organizations or in the spaces that we are on the ground. So it gives at least the businesses and the people that are in the suburbs, whoever they are, some insight in terms of what's happening and these amazing innovations that you've created. And I, I wanted to ask you, Winnie, because you are in that space of working with corporates how do you think we can create widespread impact and spread these innovations so that there is scale and that other communities can, you know, you know, re, re, like make this replicable um, so that it is not just in these situated communities, that it can become a way of life um, for society as a whole. So yeah, maybe give us some insight in terms of how you're doing that already in terms of entrepreneurship sure. and your green economy. Yeah. Sure, so there's, there's quite a few ways to be able to tackle that problem. The, the main thing is for corporates to understand that their waste has value to somebody and for them to start reaching out and looking at, speaking to people to find out if they can see it as an opportunity because I think people just see their waste as waste. They don't even consider that it could be of value to somebody else. So that's a, a great starting point because there's a lot of opportunities with people that can actually do amazing stuff, but they don't have access to those resources. 
So it's about looking at things from a community perspective to say, there must be people already out there that with this kind of resource could make and make amazing difference. So at the moment, it's really about connecting the dots, talking to different people. So that the corporates can start reaching out to the people that they're working with, but then also for communities to also start showcasing their, their works and to be able to say, well, we can actually make a difference with that waste. So the different, the difficult part is when you're working with communities, they don't have the opportunity to go and knock on the door of a corporate because they're not at that level where they have the ability to walk in. They don't have the paperwork. They don't have the right scenarios. So that's where we kind of help create the link where we say to them, you know, we can help you provide you with the opportunities to source the waste for you and then also to help take you back into the market to the corporate. So what we do is we create, we do a lot of design thinking during our training. So it's not just about the waste, but it's actually about how to run a business and how to make your business a sustainable model that the corporate will look at. Because when you start off with a small business, you will be on a home creator basis, basis and you'll be teaching your community and you'll be knocking on the doors of your neighbors and saying, oh, look at my cute curtains and stuff. But you need to look at it in a, in, at a, in a level that somebody will take to market and make it a mass production model. So if you look at big community uh, uh, projects and shops like Big Blue, I mean, Big Blue is a branch throughout South Africa and their whole thing is purely based on South African-based handmade products. That's not an unrealistic expectation because handmade stuff in the right market could become something that's sitting in the very big shopping malls. It's just about the right people taking community level projects that are very good, high quality product to market. So it is happening because people are starting to realize that it's a very important thing to support local and to stay, instead of buying from overseas and to buy mass produced eco-friendly corporate gifts and stuff from overseas, once you've put it on a ship and traveled and all of that, it's not that green anymore anyway. So let's rather support local. And it's up to the consumers to actually start saying, we don't want the thing to look the same as everybody else's. If we start demanding independent individual items, then it would be better for and easier for community to take their product to market, especially, and I'm sure that um, Rugonzo and Lim have found the same problem, is when it comes to upcycled products, you can't make a hundred of the same thing because every thing is a unique piece of art. You can't mass produce an upcycled product. So that's where the talking to everybody and everybody working with each other's challenges actually makes the biggest difference. It's really about that community cooperation and open communication. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I just where Ruganzo and you said it again, like what is our new way, word for waste? Because I think if we can change that word or change the meaning behind it, um, people will start to engage so differently. But I love some of the simple, but really uh, meaningful ideas that you've mentioned, Winnie, because it is something that is actually attainable and achievable um, just by opening up the communications and really allowing that collaboration to take place. So we're going to open up to the questions from the audience. We have one right here on the chat, and um, I'm sure you guys have seen it. So I'm going to just ask, and then whoever wants to tackle it can just pop in and feel free to add. So it says, when combining or recombining what is considered waste, to add value to its inevitable hit. Um, oh, it's inevitable for it to hit some bottleneck or some shortage in labor and time and certain materials. So could you please elaborate what that bottleneck typically is or what it is in your respective projects? Who wants to give that a go? Perhaps Tamsin? Okay, I can start. Sorry if you did. Okay. okay. Yeah, you're okay. right there. So. <laughs> Okay, so that is one of our biggest challenges is because we're trying to help corporates um, get their main waste stream out of landfill. It's really difficult to start a project and you get really involved in the project and you get a whole community set up and they can manufacture these amazing products. And then 
the waste stream dries up. So if you're not, if you're using like your standard recycling stuff, that's um, even on that level, you don't want to be taking away something that somebody is already finding of value. So for me, I don't like using the two liter Coke bottles and that kind of thing because somebody can take it, recycle it and make money from it. So if we set up community projects, it's really, really important to have the people that start giving the waste to continue doing that. Because if, they, if we get a great project going and then we've got people manufacturing this amazing product and then all of a sudden, there's a now a, a way of recycling it or they monetize it. And then the corporate doesn't want to give that to the community anymore. You kind of leave them in limbo. And that is one of the problems we do run into from time to time. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Tamsin, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I suppose with 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 the artists specifically in waste not one not they've never needed such excess of material that it's definitely gonna gonna run out or or there's not enough of it. Um, but I suppose you know I also also know certain things that aren't being recycled, like bottle caps, for example. Um, uh, and I mean, look, majority of the waste materials library is non recyclables um, because that's obviously stuff that's isn't sold at buybacks, isn't, you know, reclaimers can't take to buyback centers. Um, yeah, so we're not really, you know, the materials library isn't mass amounts of the same thing. It's it's elements of, of certain materials. And then if artists are wanting more, I get more of that. But, um, you know, working with a lot of reclaimer communities, I haven't really hit I mean, there's a lot of x-rays lying around, believe it or not. There's so much paper, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, dolls, toy dolls, um, where they aren't really able to identify what type of plastic it is. I don't think there's a shortage in the entire world of dolls. Um, <laughs> cool. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Ruganzo, would you like to add to that? I'm already in... I'm already in... Uh, amazing uh, space right now, listening to the two speakers, because when I look at uh, combining or recombine, recombining what is waste, uh, sometimes there are challenges with what to fix or join, but uh, if it's uh, a, a, a community project, then you have a lot of people who have different experiences that are coming in to help come up with ideas in which you can solve it. One of the things I interact with, uh, especially is the material that you use, you have, no, it's, it is the one dictating how it can be used. So you don't get to decide what uh, shape exactly you're going to find because you're, after all, you're picking these uh, materials. So sometimes you, you get lost out in terms of time, but, um, uh, labor also too, and I think certain materials are also not so easy to find. But when you look at that, you're limiting yourself. The basic need is for you to go out and say, I'm gonna use whatever I find, and it will dictate how you work with it. Thank you. Amazing. So true, because that is, I think, I guess what alleviates waste in the first place is looking at what we have already. Um, so thank you for that. So insightful. I wanted to share a comment from Tabiso who said, very inspirational work. I'm learning that as a working class undergraduate student and artist, creating knowledge and value around my neighborhood is also an academic practice where many opportunities can arise. This discussion is very eye-opening. So that's just to encourage you and thank you for such incredible insights. And yeah, I'm blown away just about the simple ways that we can really start thinking differently about waste. And I just wanted to hear some maybe final thoughts before we hand over back to Carolyn from each of you around like the future of you know, society in terms of a lot of speak around zero waste societies. What would that look like what would you want to see the future of South Africa or Africa um, or the global south of the globe? What would you like to see um, change or, or be different? I think around COP26 and there's so much talk around climate change, etc. We really obviously want to have 
more of a global south perspective and especially an African perspective. So I'd really be interested to hear your thoughts in terms of transforming societies and would a zero waste society actually exist in the future? So maybe you guys can each just share one minute each or one to two minutes each of your parting words of wisdom. And then yeah, we'll, we'll start to wrap it up. So Ruganzu, you look ready and at the fire. So <laughs> I'll hand it over to you. For sure, this is the time I've been waiting to share that uh, in African societies where we are blessed to be born, there is so much knowledge that is within the indigenous people that has been there before all of this was thrown onto us, you know, with all these uh, ideologies of production and producing so much materials that were not needed. And that's how they're ending up as waste. So I would like, uh, especially young people, not to uh, forget how much indigenous knowledge is very right around the corner to go and understand about their people, their, their way of life, and reflect it in their work and practice, whether it's for academic or whether it's for real life. There is too much to go back to and see that even when we talk about zero waste, we are almost looking at the picture of Africa before colonization. Thank you. Thank you. And can I add another question to that, Ruganzu, from um, on the chat, we've just received a question. It says, do you experience a changed mind, change of mindset in your community members towards waste, meaning that waste is actually pre precious, but that it is also good to avoid? I think they should be seen from two aspects. What do we do with the amount of waste, but also how do we reduce it? So perhaps Tamsin and Winnie, you can be thinking about that in terms of incorporating that into your final answers. But Ruganzu, um, perhaps you can just add to that already. Yeah, I think when you work with uh, children, uh, you are working with the future. You cannot, you know, wait to know what impact is there because then that's very like technological or like some research based, but to know that one person next to you realizes what you're doing as great is great enough for you to start. And anybody that gets inspired from your work, like I've had uh, hundreds of students, you know, come out and become eco artists. I know people that have, you know, realized that or oh, they need to realize how much they are consuming so that they could save from having too much in their household. All these conversations can go on, but I believe that the change is happening and I, I see it. Great, thank you. Uh, Tamsin? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of the art world and the gallery world, um, you know, uh, I think in terms of people, creating works with waste for the average joe for the street level cruiser to come into a space they're able to identify a bigger sculpture with all these components that are made from made from waste so it it, it feels like it automatically like equalizes um it equalizes the academic to the seven-year-old who can see a yogurt cup or whatever the case is um yeah and i mean i think going forward like maybe it's pessimistic of me to i, I can't really see a, a zero waste society in my immediate future um but i can i can see a society um you know reflecting what uh Ruganzu said um i can see a society where people are using um using their hands using their hands to make stuff craft you know craft being connected back to these sorts of materials um yeah so i think it's just about making do with what we have you know i'm not people are going to consume forever but you eat that chocolate you take that wrapper off you can do something with that that could be like i don't know a barbie's outfit or whatever what have you but yeah just just making do I love that Barbie's outfit made of chocolate wrappers. Brilliant. Um, Winnie, can you also please share your final words? 
Awesome. Thank you very much. So for me, I started upcycle back in 20, 2002, 2003. And when I used to say I do upcycling, people were totally, totally confused. I, it took me 20 minutes to just explain what that meant. In South Africa, recycling wasn't even a thing. So to explain the whole point of upcycling was really difficult. And for me, I can definitely say I do see a total trend towards the zero waste movement. I don't know it's going to happen very quickly, but I have definitely seen the change over in people's mindsets. And it's really inspiring to know that people are really starting to take cognizance of what their impact is on the world. So people are definitely looking at reducing their waste, and it is really, really important. So as much as it's great to have waste as a resource, and we are looking at ways of making that different, it's really great also to see that people are taking a conscious decision to not consume the waste in the first place. And it's very important for us as people to understand, because people are always very concerned about how they can make a difference. And the biggest place to make a difference is when you go shopping is to go, where is this waste going to go once I've bought it? How is that going to impact the planet? I mean, each of us currently, just as a scary statistic, if you can imagine uh, each of us every single day, 120 empty two-liter Coke bottles. Can you imagine that as your waste every single day? As a South African, that is what we each are responsible for on a daily basis. That's how much tonnage of waste is going into landfill. So just to scare people to be more conscious about how and what waste they're consuming. But for me, the ideal world and how I would love Africa and the world to be is to just to say to kids and to anybody in the world that's out there, you know, there's a lot of unemployed youth, there's a lot of people not knowing what to do with their life. Just start somewhere, because if you just start with a pair of scissors and a two liter milk bottle, cut it up, cut it down, cut it sideways, turn it, twist it, you will be amazed at what you can make. And just like decide today, okay, today I'm going to look at how I can take a milk bottle and turn it into jewelry. Tomorrow, I'm going to see what I can do with it in my kitchen. The next day, I'm going to see. And you stick with that two liter milk bottle for six months and you use it in every different scenario. And you, you'll be able to create a business. And I believe that we all are creative. We all have our hands and all of us can have a business from waste. So everybody that's unemployed and not doing something, start with the scissors and you'll make a difference and bring it to the world because we all have that in us. We are creative and we can make it happen. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we are all shapers as we've mentioned before. And I think you are so right. It's just what I'm taking out of this is that we, we feel intimidated when we hear that there's this huge waste issue in our communities and our societies and in the world. Um, but what you've done for me this evening has just made it so um, practical and like easy to achieve. And I think that connects us back back to what we're doing um, and being mindful of every single purchasing decision we make and how we're consuming. Every single decision is actually shaping our future. And so I really just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You were so inspirational and I really am motivated to rethink how I wake up tomorrow morning, how am I going to engage in the world as I go through my day. So I really want to just say we appreciate your time and we hope that more people get to watch this conversation at a later stage so that they are also feeling inspired and moved to make a difference in the way that they're shaping their future. Um, I'm going to hand over to Caroline, but I just wanted to say that we are going to be back discussing how we shape our future on the 24th of November with um, Water for the Future. So if you are watching right now, please come back on that Wednesday, the 24th, and tune in for that conversation. Let's hand over to Caroline. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you for those who joined the conversation. It was a very inspiring conversation and I really loved the different messages um, that you have been sharing, um, dear speakers. And I think it really gives good food for thought to see what are we doing and basically how can we also contribute in our small. And it's the kids are not only there, not only out there in the societies, but they are also in our houses. So I mean, I think we can very, we can really start at our at ourselves. And you do amazing work. Thank you that you have accepted the invitation to take part in this um, first um, panel. And we have been happy that um, 
Shade Tamsin's organization has been selected um, through the Sustainable Together project. I think they're really doing uh, having a good impact with um, what they do. I definitely come and visit um, soon. So thanks to the three of you. Thank you, Tobile, for the good um, moderation um, tonight. And like uh, Tobile already said, join us for the next uh, webinar. And um, I wish you all a nice evening. And let's use the waste we have in our creativity to do something better with it. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.